I think, uh, a large thing that has been said about not just our church, but the ICOC churches in general is that for years, we just didn't talk about things. Um, and so uh, he, here we are talking about them. Uh, when we tried to talk about them in 2020, it didn't go well, right? So it's either we don't talk about them and people are very upset, and then we do talk about them and people are even more upset because we don't know how to talk about them. And so just to give you guys a brief, uh, really, really brief overview, the gist of what Ben Barnett was teaching was that we need to learn how to have courageous conversations and how to speak to each other in a way that is going to be edifying to everybody involved. So the, the, the point is, regardless of if somebody doesn't share your point of view or if they're your worst enemy or if they come from a completely different, you know, just realm than you come from, as disciples and as kingdom people, we should have the tact and the wisdom and the love and the compassion to be able to go to anyone and listen and learn and not desire to win or to get our point of cross or to beat them over the head and tell them that they're sinners or to beat them over the head and tell them that they need to come to our church. That's not the point. The point is connection, love, empathy, and that'll enable us to really be able to have the kinds of relationships that will convince people that Jesus is actually the way to go. Um, but you're never going to convince somebody of that as you beat them up. Like, that's just, that's just not how it works. That was the gist of what Ben was talking about. Um, and then Michael Burns, he has a great book called Escaping the Beast. I want to encourage everybody to read it. When he came, I actually told him, I said, I want you to just do this book in the 45 minutes that we give you. And, and I will say, he did a fantastic job, but a, a lot of what he talked about was that the way that the world functions and that politics functions and the way that they are trying to solve the problems of the world, and I want to emphasize, all these things are trying to solve the problems of the world, Jesus provided an alternative solution. And that alternative solution was his kingdom. And the trap that we all fall into is we want to be a part of the alternative solution but also sell ourselves to the worldly solutions as well. We get caught up in it. We get confused by it. We don't know what is up and down, and we find ourselves fighting all kinds of battles that we don't need to fight because Jesus shows us how to go about these things. Again, these are just really, really uh, brief cliff notes, um, but I want to encourage you, if you didn't listen, go back and listen. The two questions that we got tonight... Uh, we're born out of those two classes. So we can go ahead. Let's bring up the first question and uh, see what is on the minds of our uh, family here. Amen. There we go. I thought we had two questions. Maybe we didn't. It was when is midweek going to be over? No. <laughs> All right. So this is a big one. Can a disciple pursue a career in politics? Can a, can, a, can a person of the kingdom, follower of Jesus, pursue career in politics? Anybody want to tackle this first? Interesting question. Um, and you think about politics and what that leads to. And, and you think about, you know, the political realm of things, you can end up being the leader of a country. You know, so you think of, you think about it from what is there to gain from politics? You go, man, that's a lofty and a good goal. You think, oh, if I get in to be a president or whatever, I could put my thing into play or whatever. So maybe it's a good thing to do that. Um, one thing you talked about is we don't always try to answer a question or start some of the answers with a scripture. So when I think of this particular question. Can a disciple pursue a career in politics? The, the scripture that came to my mind, uh, to kick it off with, is this one here. It says, I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek 
their own good, but the good of others. 1 Corinthians 10, 23-24. And so as you combine that question with this scripture, you're saying, what's the benefit? What's the constructive process is coming out of this? What's my pursuit? Am I seeking to my gain, my glory, or am I seeking to benefit others? Now, you might say, well, I'm trying to help others. But when you step back from the world of politics and say, well, the end goal is to rule a nation, what's God's perspective? How did he rule? When he came, he didn't create a physical nation or get into the structure of the world that he was in. And so to say, what's my goal? Why would I want to do this as a disciple? To share God's word to the world and to the masses? Well, you know, history tells us the Crusades try to do that too, you know, through politics and forcing folks to be something or be what God wants us to be. So although it may be something you could do, the question is, is it beneficial? Are you giving God the glory? What's the ultimate gain and goal of that, what you're trying to do? Because another thing you can think about is, well, you got laws and things that you have to operate in a certain, certain, certain mechanism in politics. Is that mechanism Christ? Will Christ be glorified by what I'm trying to do? Or is it something that I want to take on and say, I'm going to show the world how to live? So that's how I would approach that question as just as can you know as an opener for a conversation. So that's the scripture that comes to mind. Anybody else want to share on that? Well I just want to clarify. So you're saying uh, you may be able to like it wouldn't necessarily be a sin, but you have to check the motive of your heart and why are you getting into it and, and weigh the benefit of you know um, what are you trying to accomplish in going this route? Is that kind of in summary of what you're saying? Okay. All right. Anybody, any other? Okay, go ahead, Barry. Um, I think one of the things that we're trying to do here at Cola Church is create a culture where when we think about these kinds of questions, instead of having knee-jerk reactions to... Uh, messages that we've been sent by society or our upbringing or our cultural content that we're trying to say, okay, what do the scriptures say? And how does this connect with God? Because that's the essence of what you were talking about. Um, and it, this is kind of a tool that you can use with a lot of different things. I'm convinced that there are a lot of questions out there that it, it matters less which option you pick than it matters why you're doing what you're doing, which is what Dwight's talking about, in that I could decide to choose, I got a choice between A and B, and I could decide to choose choice A for a righteous reason, and that would be righteousness. Or I could decide to choose choice A for a selfish or unrighteous reason, and it would be wrong. And it's the same op it's the same choice. But depending on why I choose it, makes it either righteousness or not righteousness. Um, and I, I'm I totally agree with you. I I think that as far as politics go. If you decided, you know, I want to get into politics because there's a thing that I want to try to help uh, my community or this organization or the world do that I think is just a really righteous thing, then that's not necessarily wrong. Um, you're going to have to weigh that, though, against how polarizing am I going to be in trying to get this done. I will, I will tell you, I, I think I told you the other day, I actually thought about as a job, as a career, I actually talked about this question with Beth about, um, I thought about running for family court judge. 
I, I know a lot of people. I, I'm, not, I'm not somebody who, I don't have a lot of money, but I've got a really good name. And there are a lot of people judicially in fairly high places that would probably back me. But I had to say, you know, if I do this, you're going to have to pick a side to run with. And the minute you do that, you're going to alienate the other half of the room. Um, and I thought, I, I don't, I don't want that. I, I that's life is too, too short to, to have to deal with, with the, because we live in a super polarized society right now. And the minute you pick one side, you've irritated and alienated the other side. There may be places, there may be places in the world where things aren't nearly as polarized and this answer would be a lot more likely to give you a, yeah, sure, as a disciple, go for it, do it. But I think in the, in the world that you and I live in right now, that'd be a hard thing to do. Just so two things, the big things that I think Barry is explaining here is motive matters. And, and you know, my dad kind of touched on this, but you could have good, righteous motives for wanting to go into politics. Um, and, that, and that could be a good and righteous thing. Or you could have selfish and poor motives, uh, faithless motives, right? I'm, I'm, uh, as, when I address this question, I'll kind of get into that faithlessness. Um, but your, your heart matters, um, and, I, and I do want to emphasize, um, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit later, but a question like this where it says, can a disciple, my dad starts off with everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And I, I do want to say in these discussions about politics, um, oh, sorry, and the second thing that Barry said is that if you do go into politics, you'll probably have to choose a side. And whatever side you choose, it's going to be extremely polarizing and alienating to the other side right? The, uh, the, the very nature of American politics is antithetical to the uh, Ephesians 1, you know, Jesus came to destroy the dividing wall. Like, the way that our political system works is, no, we're not unified. We are uh, as divided as we can possibly be, and we like it, and we will go in, and we will rail against everybody who's not on our side. We get swept up in that, and there have been instances where in the church, in the evangelical world, it is normal for churches to literally choose a side, right? Well, the righteous thing to do as a church and as followers of Jesus is to be Republicans. Or the righteous thing to do is to be Democratic, right? Or the righteous thing to do is to not vote at all. And remember, no part of the system is godly. And so I want to emphasize this. The temptation can be to want to judge or condemn people for voting uh, towards the Republican route or for voting towards the Democratic route. Here's the deal. You're an American citizen. You do have the right to vote and to, you have the right to play the game. And there, you could be a disciple and have righteous reasons why you've chosen to vote democratically. And Amen. That it's not a sin to vote democratically. You can be a disciple and have righteous reasons to vote Republican route. Amen. It's, it's not a sin to do that. It's, it's because the whole game is rigged, but not rigged, that's a bad way to put it. <laughs> My true feelings are coming out about American politics. Because the whole system is just worldly powers that have been playing the same game for the last however long, right? It's a power game. So, but, but here's the deal. You do have, like, there are going to be certain things that you care about in politics and what certain policy, policies are going to do for you and your bank account and your household and your living station that if you feel like voting this way is going to help your living station be better or help other people's living station be better. What I'm saying is the word can is important in these conversations. As disciples, we should never point fingers at anybody who's doing anything politically and saying you're in sin just because you've done that thing politically, 
okay? It is not a sin to play the political game, all right? Uh, And therefore, it's not a sin to go into politics. Now, because this stuff is so polarizing and so messed up and so antithetical to the kingdom, it's it's literally factions, uh, you know, not to quote Kendrick Lamar from the pulpit, but he called them, you know, Democrats and Rebletikins, right? Like there's, there's, there's small difference between the way that the red and blue feuds politically and that the red and blue feuds uh, in the hoods of America, okay? Um, it's just one has a, a disguise of civility, okay? Um, and, I, and I share that to say, We have, this congregation has been guilty of pointing fingers and saying, if you're a Democrat, you're going to burn in hell. Or if you're a Republican, you're a, you know, a racist bigot. Like these words have been said within our congregation. And we, we need to have these conversations to say, if you find yourself saying those things, you have departed from the way of Jesus. And, and, And that's, that's the problem with all this is that when we get caught up in the factions, we start to act like the factions and we start to behave like the world behaves. This is why God is so adamant about distancing ourselves, right? From the nations around us. And we find ourselves in a strange hybrid situation, but that means as Americans, but we are disciples, we have to be the alternative. Um, You can do whatever you want politically, except for not act like Jesus. And there is no political route you can choose that is the righteous route. So choose it and have, choose it in order to please God and try to further his kingdom. And you're not in sin, whichever way you choose. Eric, were you going to share something? So I was thinking about um, this scripture here. It says over in uh, 2 Timothy 2, In verse 4, it says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not uh, receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So when you think about that scripture now, and I'm not saying we shouldn't get involved, all right? So make sure you don't think, well, we shouldn't get involved in politics, What I am saying is that you have to think about what rules you're going to have to follow as a politician. What deals, what uh, compromise, what will you have to sacrifice as a Christian to do that specific job? Now, let's just narrow it down, not just to this job, but any job you go and you pursue in the world today, there's a cost you must count. And when you count that cost, whether you're the janitor that works the overnight shift or you're the CEO of a company, you're thinking of how does this fit in my life as a disciple? How do I continue to serve God with the utmost um, Integrity without compromising the commitment. So you have to consider these things, not just in politics and not just in if I take this job here, this I'm going to be the, I don't know, secretary of state. You know, is, am I going to be able to pursue and keep my relationship with God in the utmost way possible. And if you have to ask that question of yourself, then you may not want to consider that that outcome or that position. Because the moment you have to compromise or ask yourself some of these compromising questions, it's already started to pull at you. It's already starting to send you someplace you're going to have to go for two years, four years, a lifetime. Because you don't want to get caught up in the realm of how do I get out of this? You know, we got to remember when you start to build this tower, you start to build this, this lifestyle that is no longer going to be beneficial to your next door neighbor. 
or your brother or sister at church. I always tell people, it's not the aspect of getting these things or doing these things. It's, is it, I'm going to be able to talk to the next guy right here. Am I going to be able to uh, walk in the streets and know this young man or know this young lady over here? Oh, I know you. You're that politician guy. You stand for this. And they don't no longer, they don't know that you stand for Christ. So that's why it's important when you stand for something, you got to stand for the right stuff, right? Because when you don't, everybody will know. You become a public figure. And that's where the compromise comes in. Can I show you Christ through this particular job? I'm going to venture off the specific question a little bit um, and talk more about how we talk to each other, um, especially when it has to do with politics. It says uh, in Ephesians 4, Paul tells the church here to be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. And uh, when we bear with one another, you know, it's really important to, uh, like Perry was saying about listening, uh, to think about what they're saying, don't react. Be gentle, be patient, and uh, that definitely <clears throat> definitely goes with uh, uh, politics. Uh, one thing about politics is on a national level, you know, we can really get, say, well, we definitely wouldn't want to do that. But on a local level, it may be a little easier to get into some a political uh, job. Uh, may not be a judge, Mary, but <laughs> it, it, it could be, you know, school board or something like that, that, that you don't have to pick sides so much. So uh, that might be a little easier than the national level. And, and I just, I want to say something about the idea of, you know, politics versus the kingdom, the kingdom being an alternative place. And, and when I see this question, what I think to myself is, can a disciple pursue a career in politics? Well, we all know that a disciple is a follower of Jesus. All right. So then let's change the question. Uh, can Jesus pursue a career in politics? Did Jesus pursue a career in politics? Right? And, and so in John 6, I think this is so funny. Uh, so um, it says that in verse 1, sometime after this, Jesus crossed the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. All right, so they see this. He's a miracle worker, and he's literally healing people from their ailments. All right? The kind of things that we're all sad about, that we're all worried about, uh, you know, the, the sick and the dying, Jesus is just out there, you know, fixing it, all right? And, and it says that a great crowd of people are following him because of this. It says the Jewish Passover was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people? Uh, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite, right? Now, it's funny because this is where a lot of politics come into play right? How do we take care of the poor, right? How do, we, how do we fill these gaps in society, right? The world is broken. How do we fix it? And, and Peter, so Jesus asks a valid question, right? How do we, from the world's point of view, where, where are we going to buy enough food to feed these people? And, and uh, sorry, is it, it was Peter, right? Sorry, Philip. Philip's like, we don't have that kind of money. It, it, it would take a lot of time to, uh, for the world's uh, powers to fix this. Andrew comes up and he's like, hey, I got a kid, you know, uh, he has five small barley loaves and two small fish, uh, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, well, have the people sit down, right? People sit down. Jesus takes the loaves. He gives thanks. He distributes the food. He does the same with the fish. Um, when they had all had enough to eat, all right? So he feeds them all right, with this very small amount of food. He says, gather the pieces that are left over. Not only were they all full, there was leftovers. So they gathered them and filled the 12 baskets with pieces, five barley loaves left over by uh, those who had eaten. Verse 14, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king, 
by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. This is crazy. So they're like, all right, uh, you know, we don't have a system that's going to feed all these people. Jesus is like, I got you. Remember, they just saw him healing all the people. And then he feeds all the poor with miraculous powers. Who wouldn't want that superhuman to be the leader of their country and to fix all the problems all the time? These people had the right idea. And Jesus recognized that. And Jesus, he said, okay, they see my power. They're going to try to literally overthrow Herod, Caesar, and put me on the throne. They're going to try to make me president. So what did he do? Did he say, all right, I got my foot in the door, right, and start running for office? No. He ran away. And he, and he, and he hid. It said he, he, he went by himself. Why? This tells us a few things about the church and the kingdom and the way it works and God and, and, and it's juxtaposed against politics. One thing it tells us is that the kingdom is not supposed to fix all the problems of the world all the time whenever the problems feel like they want to be fixed. That's a, it's a common misconception, right? In fact, what the kingdom does and what Jesus is trying to teach is that these Surface level problems, the hunger, the sickness, all these kinds of things, the plight of human beings, they are either just a part of nature or they're a part of the darkness of the human heart. The kingdom's role is to transform human beings. Only transformed human beings can then go in mass and change the world. And I, I bring this up because I think what happens, and I know I, we speak strongly about, you know, don't get caught up in the politics, but I think what happens is most people are just, there's, there's way too much social media. There's way too much access to the problems that are happening in the world. 50 years ago, like, yeah, uh, you know, you might have seen a giant world-shaking thing on the news, but you're not going to get seven videos a day of somebody getting shot in the street or mugged, or a thousand stories of, you know, uh, the Me Too movement, of just people, you know, we get flooded with the evil ramifications of society every single day, all the time. So we are a society that is not only privy to the darkness of the world, but we feel extremely powerless. And I think most people are feeling this, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rough thing to feel. It's a rough position to be in. And, and the question comes to all of our minds, how do we help? How do we fix it? Right? And we begin to clamor and reach for solutions. But when that happens, the kingdom of God becomes secondary. Because it just isn't working fast enough. A uh, sister who left the church several years ago explained to me, she said, yeah, the church just wasn't doing enough for this specific problem in the community. So I felt more powerful and effective joining the social program than I did, you know, coming to church and singing songs about God. And, 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 I, and I felt for her. I'm like, like, amen, everybody wants to feel like they're making a difference. But it was obvious that her idea of what church was was just so far from what the biblical church is supposed to be, right? The thing that is opposing the gates of Hades, right? This offensive force of life that is going into the world and transforming people. And I think we begin to get faithless and not understand the role. And, and, and even it, it goes to why people, they, they want us to, from the pulpit, talk about this social issue or that social issue, or we were accused of, Literally, I, a black man, was accused of being racist during 2020 because we were, quote-unquote, silent from the pulpit about, quote-unquote, racial issues. I'm not minimizing the fact that there are racial issues. But the Bible teaches us that we have to love everybody like ourselves. 
That means baseline, if you're a Christian, you're not allowed to be a racist. <laughs> you don't have the right to be a racist as a Christian, right? And, and so we get so confused and think the Bible doesn't address these things because we're not using the specific terminology of the world, but we are adhering to a higher law. We are adhering to higher concepts that solve all of these issues that we are seeing in the world. And the role of the church here is to develop every single person who's going to come and want to be a part of the kingdom to be a kingdom person. And, and, and I mentioned this, we were having this conversation the other day. The frustration can be, it would be like, it would be like my son coming to me and being like, you know what? It'd be like, you know, he goes to the neighbors. He's just like, you know, my dad's not a good dad because he hasn't solved the war in the Ukraine yet. And he hasn't fixed what's going on in the Gaza Strip. All he does is tell me I can't have candy when I want candy. All he does is try to spank me and tell me how to live my life, right? When I'm, you know, imagine Shiloh. All he does is tell me that I can't dig when I want to dig, right? Well, it's because one, as a dad, I'm powerless to do anything about the Ukraine, okay, or the Gaza Strip. And as a dad, my role is to raise him into a mature human being. The leadership of the church, guys, one, we're powerless to do anything about the Ukraine except for pray, and we've created a whole prayer night for those kinds of situations. But our role is to help those of us who are here live like Jesus. And the last thing I'm going to add to that is when it comes to patience, one, recognize that the kingdom isn't going to fix all these problems on a world scale as fast as you want them to. In fact, I don't think the kingdom is going to do it ever until Jesus comes back. And if the kingdom does do it, it does it through helping other people live like Jesus. So there are people who are like, we talk too much about uh, evangelism and not enough about racism. And I'm like, sharing the gospel of the kingdom is addressing racism and every other sin out there. Because when we sit down and we study the Bible, you know what we teach people? You can't be a racist. And you have to love your neighbor. And you have to take care of the poor. Right? There's also a dichotomy between the idea of like, well, the church only talks about evangelism and it doesn't talk about serving the poor. Guess what? When we teach people to follow Jesus, you know what we have to teach them? If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to serve the poor. You have to be actively engaged in this. Everything that we're doing when we evangelize, we're not adding members to the church. We are helping people develop into Jesus' people. But again, I think the last thing I want to say on that is patience matters. And there are going to be all of us who are in different places spiritually. When these things come up, we're not going to handle them like Jesus. And the goal is not to go on a witch hunt and to figure out, okay, which, which one of these guys is really racist, right? And then go and beat them over the head and say, you, you know, you, you white people, I, I knew you were just closeted racist. And we're laughing. This happened in 2020. Phrases like that were said in 2020. Regardless of somebody's sin, our role as disciples is to one, be in discipling relationships, to help each other live by the standard. But to two, number two, as we help people, we have to be patient and give them the opportunity to learn and to grow. And I think that is the difficult thing. We all want the fast solution, kick them out of the church. What if every time, like there's specific sins where we feel like that's the case, right? What if every time we sin, that was just our disciples' decision? Like, oh, you lusted again? You know, elders, get him out. You know, you argue with your spouse again? Kick him out of the church. We have to have patience. Bear with the failings of the weak. I mean, the, the, the scriptures are there, guys. And, and this is about being an alternative community. And that'll never happen if we're treating each other like the world treats each other. Um, anything else? Yeah. I want to pile on what you just said, because you guys all know somebody who they walk around and they've got um, earbuds in their ears all day long, and they're constantly listening to some kind of constant stream of something all day long. And maybe it's the Bible Project, and amen if it is. But, <laughs> but most of the time, most of the time, 
we're getting this constant stream of social media negativity. And if you decide to immerse yourself in a constant barrage of social media negativity, guess what? You're going to be negative and probably depressed. And, and you, you really kind of need to check yourself about, okay, if I compared the amount of time that I spent looking at CNN news to the amount of time that I spent praying about problems in the world or the amount of time I spent reading my Bible, what would that look like? If I, if I watched all this truly disgustingly negative stuff that, that ends up on Facebook or whatever, compared to the amount of time that I spent actively engaging in real conversation with my brothers and sisters, what does that look like? Um, there are some of you who just need to decide probably from about August to November to not watch the news. Uh, if it's going to really bum you out, that you need to stay away from it. If you're mature enough to deal with it, amen. But if it's going to make you a negative, bitter person, you need to find something else to fill up your mind and your heart and your thoughts with. Um, I, I, I just, I, I wonder how much time we spend praying and talking to God about things versus how much time we'd spend listening to Satan on social media. Um, I also want to, one of the reasons when I studied the Bible, one of the reasons why I did that is I wanted to change the world. I, I believed in that. And I still do. Um, I, I, I think we need to be people that are so filled with hope. A different kind of hope. The kind of hope that, that Perry's talking about. Um, we're so filled with hope and real solutions that we don't worry about people sucking us into all these crazy, all, all these crazy arguments and causes. And we can be kind and generous with them because we can say, you know what? You figured out a problem. Amen. Great. But I actually know a real solution to this. That's a powerful thing. And I know that there are, there, I, I all the campus folks, go find all the, all the crazy idealist uh, folks that want to that wanna change the world. Go find them. We want them. I want to change the world. Um, for those of you who have been around a while and you've been beat up a little bit and you've seen a lot of battle, it wasn't in vain. It's not in vain. In here in Columbia, we've done some things that have changed the world. Um, really changed the world. In, in real ways, not in, not in all this crazy, in real ways, we've changed the world. And I think that's beautiful. Um, and I, I think we need to not, we need to not abandon hope because we have it. We've actually got real hope. Yeah, we can, um, before we move on to the next question, I just want to uh, lay kind of some of these practicals out here. I just want to state this very clearly. Um, you, if you want to vote and, you know, cast your vote to the Democrats, Republicans, Independents, you can. Uh, have a godly reason to do it. And there are godly reasons, and remember, they're gonna the the different parties are gonna use different godly things to convince you because of your faith that you should go with them. Don't be fooled by that, right? Um, but but really have a conviction about why you think going this route is gonna you know fix a certain issue that you know. But but recognize it's not sin. 
either way, okay? Um, it can be, depending on where your heart is, about that. But that's every decision that you make in life. Uh, but participating in politics is not sinful. Um, not participating in politics is also not sinful. I think there's a, I think there's a very biblical reason uh, you could really make an argument like, I just... I think abstaining from it, that, that's fine too. What, what we want to get across to the church is you've not lost or you've not fallen into sin when you've decided to vote for this party or that party. You've fallen into sin when you condemn those who don't vote like you. That is when you have fallen into sin. That is what is sinful. And we just cannot be a congregation that bites and devours one another. We should be the kind of congregation that sits down with somebody who's on the opposite side and says, you know, why did you do that? And we have a conversation and they explain why they didn't. You say, amen, you know, I don't necessarily agree. And I voted this side. I voted this way because of that reason. But amen, at the very least, we're both from our own heart and faith trying to do the thing that we feel like is the best thing to do. Um, and then we should be able to go out and eat and have fun and be friends with each other. Um, but there is no such thing as like, because I voted in this direction, I now represent everything that is the Democratic Party. That's not how voting works. I'll never forget the vote. First time I, I went to go vote, I'll share this and we'll move on to the next question. I was 18 years old and young black man, Obama was running. And I went and I just, I wanted to be a part of history. I wanted to be like, yeah, I, I voted the first black man into the presidency, right? And I went in there and, and mind you, I'm about to express the, the extreme level of my ignorance. I went in there and I thought it was going to be like Obama or the other guy. I don't remember who the other, McCain. I don't remember who the other guy was. I thought it was going to be like, you know, you check one or the other. They started asking me all these questions about all these different offices and positions and it was like nine pages of different people I had to vote for. <laughs> and I realized in that moment, not only had I, I had no idea about any of these people, I had no idea about the difference between the Democratic Party. Well, I didn't, I didn't know any of it. And so I just, I said, Democrat. And then it was all Obama, you know, that's how you vote. Like you could, you could choose an option. that just went to the whole party. I, I voted that and I walked out. And I made the decision. And you can judge me if you want. You can condemn me. If you condemn me, you're in sin. But I made a decision. I made a decision that if I was going to vote, I would have to study this stuff like I studied the Bible. And I was not willing to do that. I said, this stuff is not, this is not what changes the world. And I, I don't vote. I abstain from voting. Because I, there's just... And, 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 I, and I, when I see Southern Christianity, people who are so adamant about Jesus but don't know a thing, it reminds me exactly of what we do with politics. There are these huge things that we talk so fervently about, we know a fraction of the information. And we are willing to kill each other over it. It's insanity. I'm willing to say I'm dumb. I don't know all this stuff. And so I'm not going to put my opinion in when I'm the idiot here, right? Now, many of you, you might be doing your research and your homework and you might, you know, and amen. I think if you're going to vote, you need to be doing all that homework. But at the end of the day, we have to recognize the kingdom of God is the thing that we have decided in those waters to put first. If you don't agree, if you're like, no, I do think politics are going to make all the difference. Amen. That's not the Jesus route, though. When we come here, the goal is that the scriptures and the Holy Spirit develop us into people who know how to treat our worst enemies like our best friends. That is what we are here to do as the kingdom of God. Um, anything you guys want to share about politics? Okay. Amen. Let's go to the next question. 757. I don't know if we'll be able to open it up tonight. Ooh, okay. And we have, and we have no women on this panel, so I don't even know how accurate, I don't know how accurate our answer is going to be right now. Um, I will say our women opted to, not to be on the panel, so that might tell you something about where we're at. 
It says, will we allow a, a woman to preach to the congregation on a Sunday? All right, that's a, that's a, a loaded question. Um, the first thing I'll say is we typically, so we typically don't let anybody preach on a Sunday except for the lead evangelist uh, or, a, a, you know, a brother who's on staff, but it's typically the lead evangelist um, or one of the elders. Now, I share that to say, in our church, we don't, we don't just have like an open pulpit type situation, all right? It's not, you know, our Sundays are not open mic Sundays. Um, so on a, on a, like on a general, like just how we operate, we don't have a woman as our lead evangelist. Therefore, typically a woman wouldn't be uh, preaching from the pulpit on a Sunday morning. That's, that's kind of a general statement about just kind of how we operate. The second thing is we come from a... Um, I'm going to say this as concise as possible. Our movement of churches comes out of what is known as the restoration movement. The idea of the restoration movement was we want to move away from the extra biblical concepts that we see in a lot of the denominations. We don't just want to be another denomination that has all these different creeds. We want to be people who respect the scriptures and who live by the scriptures. So while most people focus on Sola fide, faith alone, we, sw we, we swung the pendulum and said, we said sola scriptura, okay, scripture alone. Now, obviously, if you say anything alone, I think you're getting into dangerous territory. We need both faith and scripture. But I share this to say, we come from a movement that is very, um, how should I put it? The word has been very highly regarded in our movement. And... To the point where, like, uh, I think it was um, Alexander Campbell, like if you go read his writings, he believed that the New Testament was supposed to be the, uh, he called it the constitution for the modern church. That meant that the guys who started the restoration movement believed that everything in the New Testament was prescriptive. That when you read the New Testament, and you see a scripture, they believed we need to do that exactly like it's telling us to do that, okay? So our movement of churches comes from that kind of mindset. We have tried to adhere very strongly to very, I'm going to say, quote unquote, clearly what we see in scripture, okay? But even an extreme stance like that leaves little room for exegesis, all right? If you're just taking things on a surface level, we all know that when you study the Bible, there has to be some level of figuring out, well, who's writing this? Who are they writing it to? What are the issues they're writing about? So with just a little bit of exegesis, you recognize that some scriptures, for instance, Timothy saying, or Paul saying to Timothy, hey, drink some wine for your upset stomach, you know, every once in a while before you go to bed. We know that's not prescriptive. And we don't all, when we have a tummy ache, go drink some wine because the Bible told us to, right? We recognize that certain scriptures were for the time and day. Uh, and certain scriptures were for the ubiquitous eternal church that was going to be on the earth. So this is where women's roles come in, okay? Our church specifically and, well, let me say this, Christianity specifically, uh, but particularly our movement of churches, has been very conservative when it comes to women's roles, okay? Um, and our congregation, I would argue, is still relatively no, I would say we're still pretty conservative. There's two things I want to say about that. One, we are in a culture outside of the church that is extremely progressive, okay? So things like, you know, um, women's rights and, and, and putting women out there and, you know, women can go be, you know, bad bosses and they can go and that is very prominent in our society. Our society is really moving towards, like, we want women to do everything that men do, okay? Um, that, along with other things, right? There's a whole slew of things that goes with that progressive mindset. So I want to say this, and, and, and I, if you, you can criticize us for this if you'd like, but... Just because the culture is moving in a certain direction doesn't mean that 
the kingdom of God needs to move in the same direction. Now, I'm not saying that we're not going to really examine women's roles and figure out, okay, what are the scriptures actually saying and those kinds of things. But I will say, we are not going to change what we do because the world is saying that that's the, what we should be doing right now. Like, we're not going to be reactionary to the world. The world is not going to dictate what the kingdom of God does. Now, mind you, sometimes the world can make some good points, okay? Uh, and, and, and we're not so dense to be like, you know, everything they're saying is demonic. So, but, but I want to say that. We're not going to rush and, you know, uh, the, the, the next, you know, the next time you hire a lead evangelist, you're going to uh, hire a woman because the world says that, you know, they can do it now too. Like, that's just... We're not going to be hasty in anything that we do. In saying that, I'll mention this second thing, and then, I'll, and then I'll give it to them. But one, I think we are all in kind of different positions on where we're at when it comes to women's roles. I think I lean far more liberal, and I think some of these guys lean far more conservative. Um, and I won't even say far. I think far is um, un, unfair. I just I think we're in different we're in different places mindset-wise. Um, but if we do change anything, it's going to come with a lot of study, a lot of us getting into the Word, a lot of us being, you know, vulnerable and honest and, and, and working together and having con conversations with the congregation. Like, we're not just going to change something. And to change something like this, and it's something we've done, and it's something that we've been okay with until the world told us we weren't. And maybe some of the women are like, uh-uh, I always wanted to preach. But like some, most, a lot of these things, like you, you talk to people 30 years ago, we were fine with the way things were, and, and convicted about it too. And, 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 hey, and women would be the ones telling you like, uh-uh, don't you be getting up there and running off at the mouth, you know, in front of all the men. Like, we were convicted about it. So now that the world is, you know, freaking out about it, I, I think we can get very, um, um, it can impact us. So the answer is we're probably, we're not going to have a women lead evangelist. Um, we are going to try to, as much as we can, figure out where the gifts are in the congregation and give as many opportunities as possible to let people utilize their gifts, okay? Um, and that, if that means a woman is fantastic at speaking, we're going to try to figure out how to make sure that that gift is utilized in this congregation. But when it comes to the specific, I hate to use the word politics, of how it all works and the headship and the scriptures, this is why we have Solid Food Midweek. And this is going to be a topic that we address. We're going to sit down and get into the word and study together and figure out Hey, are we going to stay like we've been going? Or are we going to uh, move in a different direction? But it's, it's going to be study and conversation, and it's not going to happen overnight. And if we're too slow in that, we apologize. But these are big things, guys. And we need to be respectful to the word um, and make sure that we are um, adhering to that as much as, as, much as possible. Uh, anything you guys want to wanna add to that? Yeah. <laughs> Take the mic from him. All right, that's, that's where really talk. <laughs> he said he leaned kind of to the one side. Uh, I do want to start with this scripture because that's a very good question as, as the first question and, and very thought-provoking, and we need to ask questions like this because it is what you hear in society, what you hear and what you see going on with equality. Nothing's wrong with, being e nothing wrong with being equal. In the eyes of God, we are all, all equal when it comes to being a child of God. Right. We all have roles as well, though. So, the scripture I want to start off with says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. 2 Corinthians 5 uh, verse 16. So when we think about this question, what point of view are we coming from? Is it a worldly point of view that says, over time, we want equal rights for everybody, so everybody should do, this, do the same thing? I like Bert's answer that 
there's, what's the rush and the, you know, no reaction say, just because society says this is what is going on with equality, we should change without studying out from the scriptures and not regarding that thought from a worldly point of view. We must always regard it from scripture's point of view, from Christ's point of view, from when he established, well, just, and so you think of God as a God of order, right? You know, total chaos before he started, things, darkness, chaos, everything. Then he puts things in order. He sets precedence. And there was sequences of events and things happened. Things were made this day, that day. This was in charge here. And so if you look at the precedence of things that have been set, you ask yourself a question. What is God trying to tell me? What is God trying to tell us? What order did we have or do we have, do we see from the scriptures? Again, it's not a better or worse. It's just a role. It's a position. It's something where something was started here, it's here, and now it's here. And yes, there's growth and there's understanding, but we've got to be careful on when we say, hey, the world in every other aspect, hey, equal rights for athletics, equal rights in school, yes, they, when it comes to knowledge of the world, have at it. But from God's point of view, we be very careful when we say, because the world's doing it, we should do it too. And I do lean strongly in saying, that's probably not a direction we would go. Women's Day, fine, preach on. But again, it goes back to my first, also my first scripture. Everything's beneficial, but not, every, not everything's permissible, but not everything's beneficial. What's the motive behind that question? Why? Ask yourself in your heart, what's driving why that's the necessary question? Is it because the world says it is? What does the scripture say it is? We can get really caught up into things that we see and say, hey, I want to be just like that. I want to be that. You know, we're called out of the world to be what God has set us apart to be. And as we are kingdom builders, we need to act as kingdom people, understanding the structure of the kingdom and what's it's been established. So that's my thoughts on that. So. Yeah, I think one thing uh, we talked about was that in the house churches, um, there's some good opportunity for women who are really good preachers to at least share, right? Uh, to share some thoughts, to be spiritual. I think the more you practice speaking in a, from a spiritual mindset, then uh, you can share in house church and things like that. Then, you know, we can, uh, that will help us, I think, decide who should be preaching and who shouldn't. I know, <laughs> I know Perry, uh, Perry's a great, great speaker and uh, you know, he's a spiritual man and I think he's the one for, for right now, but uh, if you think you qualify, maybe you need to try out, you know. <laughs> hey, there you, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, I think often we think about what weapons are we fighting with? Second Corinthians, I think it's 10, something like that. I might be wrong. Hold on. Let me. I'll, it is written. Yeah, Second Corinthians 10. It does talk about the weapons we fight with. You know, and I'm not going to think about the weapons so much as the mindset that you bring into the church. Because I believe our mindsets is what drives our actions a lot of times. And we, sometimes we get this worldly mindset that, oh, they're doing it over there at Second Church on the street corner down there. But there's a hundred churches probably in the radius of our church building. Within 25 miles, you probably can go somewhere and find exactly what you're looking for. Does it make it right? Doesn't make it wrong. But I'm of the mindset that, you know, men, <laughs> God calls us to lead, right? He calls us to step forth. And I think a lot of times, you know, because we don't know if it's a man or a woman that asked this question, you know, but able-bodied men were called 
And why would you want to give up your position that God's called you to to be like the world? Able-bodied men. We have a lot of men in this church. A lot of these young guys and young women sit in these rows right in the front two rows right here. But you think about it. We all sat in that first row once upon a time, you know. And you have to aspire to do something. You know, and pity the man that allows the woman to be that Deborah. No, no. Oh, look up Deborah. <laughs> Go study it out. It's in just that gives you the opportunity to learn something. But, I mean, she was appointed when there was no men to lead. Okay? And I'm looking at a bunch of men out here. Okay? So, I just want to say, we got to just think about our mindsets, you know? How do our mindsets match up with the scriptures? You know, how does our mindsets uh, glorify God? Now, and this question isn't an ungodly question. It's a practical, it's something we have to address. And we understand that, that we have to address this question because there's churches in our movement that are addressing this question. So we have to do it likewise. So, amen. I, I, I think we have some terrific women, and I think it's our job to create spaces that our women can flourish and um, glorify God. I was going to say, again, the tool, we're, the tool that we're trying to, the lens that we're trying to filter all this through is okay. Every single one of these questions, what pleases God? It matters why I do what I do. It matters. In 1 Corinthians 14, it's not talking about women's issues. It's talking about a different kind of issue they were having in service. But it says everything must be done so that the church may be built up. That's got to be our goal. What's your goal? Uh, if, if our goal is to insist on... That's not a good goal. Okay, <laughs> that's not a good goal. Um, if our goal is, well... All the men are lazy, so uh, we got to get somebody to do something. That's not a good goal either. You know, it's, it, Eric's absolutely right. and they, it, it, Some of y'all need to step up. But I, I, I think there's some beautiful space for some of our, our, our women to be part of a team instead of us or them it can be both of us. It, there, a, a team of us doing some stuff together. And that may be on a Sunday uh, morning. And I've heard some really beautiful things from some of the women uh, that get up to like either do the welcome or they help uh, with a communion message or something like that. And we're not going to all poof off into hell. Um, it, but I, I think that that at the same time, there's also got to be some room for, hey, look, people have different kind of roles. And, and we, want, we want the women to flourish, but we want the guys to step up and flourish too. We want both of those things to happen. And we think God does too. So it, that's kind of where we're at right now. And this is not a fully formed kind of thought, but that's where we're at right now. Yeah, and, I, and to close out, I think, one, I want to say, like, both of these questions, you're getting into the territory of, like, this is not, these are not salvation issues, right? You, you, uh, if, if we did have a woman preacher, we, that's not a sin kind of thing. It's, it's, it's a whole different kind of subject that the Bible is talking about when it comes to the church organization. But because we have been extremely conservative in our organization, we are where we are currently. 
right? And it's not because we have bad hearts or because our desire was to be patriarchal and oppressive to the women. That's just, that's never been, we've, we've been trying to be true to the scriptures. That, that has been our intention. Um, and so as we, and, and I will say this, like, I'll apologize on our, on the leadership's behalf of not addressing it as quickly as many people might want us to. But look, when we, you know, when, when I took over the, you know, when I started leading the church and, and this team kind of got formed, there were just a lot of bigger fish to fry, okay? Like, we were, not, I'm not gonna say we were barely Christians, but we were, there was just a lot of stuff that we had to figure out and get to a place where we can even begin to have these conversations. And, and, and this is us beginning these conversations. I do want to say this. I think we should all check our hearts, though. So I want to bring out a scenario. Let's say we, as a leadership and as a congregation, we, we do some study, we have some uh, conversations, and we get into this thing. Let's say we arrive at the place where we let, that, that the pulpit is uh, far more freer to the women than it's ever been before. Let's say we arrive at that. And... Just hearing that, where does your heart go? Does it sink and you think, well, okay, when that day comes, I'm out of this place, right? Like, if that's where you are, I think that's problematic because the goal is that we go on this journey together and that we arrive together, right? Now, let's say we do all this, we have these conversations and we arrive at a place where we're like, well, no, we're going to stay relatively or conservative. If you're like, man, if they definitively stand on that for the rest of their lives, I'm out of this place. Again, like, I think that's the bad heart to have. We shouldn't be, it should never be our goal to be waiting for the, for the one thing that the pulpit's going to do or say for us to hightail it out of there. Like, we are a family. And, and we are no more spiritual than you guys. We're all in the same boat working on this together, right? And so let's work on it together. Because I even think, I mean, I could, I play devil's advocate all the time. There are several things that, you know, were said between me and all the guys tonight that I know there's 12 arguments coming to you. Okay, what does it mean to build up the church? You know, what does it mean for people to flourish, right? What does it mean for uh, what men to lead? Like, and that's where all the arguments, you know, all the discussion come from. And we will get into the word and we will go on this journey together. Um, my only encouragement is be patient and join us in this endeavor. Um, that means that nights like this need to happen more often in smaller groups, okay? We can't be the only ones talking about it, right? We need to make sure that the, anytime something is said from the pulpit or we have a panel or we have a teacher come, these are just conversation starters. Yeah. And we should be in each other's lives, being open and vulnerable. Hey, when that brother said that, it made me struggle, Okay, well, why, why, you know, why are you struggling about that? Well, because I feel like this scripture says that. Okay, well, let's, let's sit down. Let's, let's wrestle through the scriptures together, right? That's what Israel got that name because he wrestled with God as a, as a congregation, as people who are imperfect but trying to be kingdom people. That is what we're supposed to be doing, wrestling constantly to make sure that we are glorifying God and edifying the church. Um, yeah, it is 821. Two questions, chock full of all of this stuff. Um, let's continue to have these conversations. Amen? Um, I hope this was helpful uh, for you. Sorry if we gave all the wrong answers. Um, my advice is don't leave. Just uh, pray for us. Amen. Um, let's see. Barry, would you like to close us out in the word of prayer? Let's pray. God, thank you so, so much for letting us be your people. And God, we want to love you. We want to serve you. We want to please you. We want to make you happy and give you glory and you honor in everything we do. And God, I pray that as, as all kinds of ideas and philosophies and movements and different kinds of, of, of winds of philosophy or, or cultural uh, ideology, it, it, as all of that blows through our lives, God, that we will seek in every single way to be your people, to be your voice, to be your hands, to be your feet, God, to be 
be the voice of the kingdom of God. God, we love you so, so much. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.